if they need to, what they will do is they'll hear two conflicting sides of what happened and they will make a decision based on perhaps the other findings that have been made and they can make findings based just on how a person presents. Hello and welcome to this episode for the Survivor Diaries. Uh, this episode is focusing, the long-awaited episode, on witness statements and preparing evidence. This episode could be watched in conjunction with an episode that we've done previously about position statements. Just explaining briefly, the position statement is not necessarily directed for every hearing, the court may even not accept it. The purpose of doing a position statement, as I've said in that video, is, it, is that it helps you as an exercise. It helps you to feel calmer going into court and it helps you to set out what your position is so that worst case scenario, you can hand that across to the judge if you're feeling that in a courtroom with your abuser, and especially if you're present, representing yourself, that uh, you can just hand that over and then you can get your position across. So we're looking at witness statements. I'm just going to disclaim first of all that I am a solicitor in England and Wales. I'm a family lawyer and so if you are watching outside of those two jurisdictions this may not be the law that applies to you and therefore you should obviously bear that in mind. There are things that you can get from these episodes about the nature of domestic abuse, um, the abusive personality and I'd even say that the way that the child arrangements is manipulated is the same the world over. However, my advice, my legal advice, or my, my legal area is England and Wales. I'm giving very general advice, even though we're discussing in this episode witness statements, which is of course very specific to your own case. Remember that this is general advice that I'm giving and my advice very strongly in this episode is that you must look at the last order, which orders the um, filing of witness statements because it will have specific directions on there but I will come back to that in a second and as always I am referring to Pat Craven's model of the dominator throughout um, that's because domestic abuse is a gender issue um, it's, it's the biggest global killer of women remember and it extends from the patriarchal society I disclaim this in all of my videos I am going to fall into that um, model and the idea that the abuse is occurring in a very gender-based way. Just disclaiming that from the start. So as I mentioned before, an episode about witness statements. So the first thing that you need to do before you start this is look at the order which directs that you have to make a witness statement. This will be <clears throat> somewhere in the last order and what I'm going to do now is flash up on the screen something from the the master template for writing these orders so you can see the kind of directions that the court may give you about this witness statement. So the first thing to check is that you know what the witness statement is going to be about and the, the order may say it's on the issue of the holidays, on the issue of the child arrangements, um, setting out evidence for allegations, so it will be, be quite specific. Some of the other things that they may ask or that they may state that the order must be, it may be a certain number of pages, you must pay attention to that. Look at the font size and the font spacing and all that sort of thing. That is set out in the order. If the court is trying to keep the statements quite short, then they will restrict the number of pages. That, to be clear, is the number of pages of written text. If you have some exhibits afterwards, providing they're not ex excessive, they are not included in your word count. That's my understanding. Okay, so the statements do have a common pattern and that's what we're going to explore in this episode. I want to talk you through how to write a statement. So if you're approaching this episode, knowing that you have to write a statement for court, I'm hoping that this will help you to set it out. Always relate it to your own situation. So going through then, we're going to have a flow chart that sets out these steps. Very much like the position statement episode, we're going to work backwards through what we need to do. So you need to have a blank piece of paper. In my case, I tend to have large pieces of paper, uh, pencils, colours, all that sort of thing. Um, we're starting off with very, very focused then, order sort. Okay, so if you put order sort at the top of your page, and just give me some bullet points of what you are looking for the court to do. Again, bear in mind the hearing that you're going for. So this may be a, a statement for a finding of fact hearing, um, in which case, what are you looking for the court to find? So 
in very general terms, and again, I'm falling into what these videos are about, which is domestic abuse continuing through the child arrangements. So if the order sought was that the perpetrator of the abuse uh, undertakes a domestic abuse perpetrator program, um, and you want the court to find that there is abuse in the relationship and it is affecting you and it is affecting the children, if that's the case. So it may be for the statement for fact finding, it may be a statement for a contested final hearing and it may be that within this you are discussing the arrangements for contact, you may also be asking the court to make some findings here in relation to how the contact has been or other difficulties, sometimes you may even be covering the abuse at this stage as well. It may be a statement for a non-molestation order, again for a contested hearing, and I'm coming up back onto that in a second, and the purpose of the statement, how it result, how it connects with the, the hearing that's coming on. So it may be a final hearing, contested for a non-molestation order or an occupation order, and you should be able to use this template, this guide, for all of these. So order sought might be um, an order that the respondent in that application for a non-molestation order is forbidden from using violence, pestering, harassing, contacting you unless it's about the child arrangements contacting you at all, the things that you would expect in a non-molestation order. And yes, we have got an episode coming on about non-molestation orders. You set out the order sort then. So you know the proceedings, you know what you want the court to do. So we're starting off very, what's the ideal outcome at the end of this hearing that we're going to? Because your statement is being prepared for a hearing. Your statement is your main evidence in chief. And I've spoken to a lot of people who think, I, I haven't got evidence for this, or, and there's quite a few domestic offences, offences that would happen just between the two people. By the nature of domestic offence, it's all behind closed doors. So the chances are that the only two witnesses are the abuser and the person being abused. And if this is the co-parenting situation, there may have been children upstairs, children too young to sort of like say what they saw, anything like that. So it may come down just to the word of each of the parties and literally who is more believable and the courts are allowed to do that in the family courts. We can go on the balance of probabilities and what the judge or the magistrates may do is look at the other points that have been raised and if they can see a pattern of lying from the abusive behaviour they're more likely to find in the favour of the party that they see is telling the truth, for example. So that's how you want the court to make findings, what you want the court to find and what you want the court to order. And we're going on to the second section. So just put an arrow down from your bullet points there. And now why is the question. This is your position. So if you are the applicant in a non-molestation order, it's the applicant's position. If you are a respondent, respondent's position. You may be responding to a child arrangements application. And this is where you set out why. Why do you want that order? So in a case of uh, supposing we're going to fact finding in child arrangements and <clears throat> you want that order so that the other party, the abusive party, will change their behaviour if necessary through a domestic violence perpetrator programme so that yourself and the children can be safe. Okay, and you set, you're going to set out what's been going on but we're keeping it in very sort of bullet point language at this point. Okay, so just bullet point notes. You've done two sections, order sort and your position, why you want that order. Okay, once you've done that, you're going on to a third section and this is where we're going to expand quite a bit here and the question that I'm asking you is what evidence supports this position? You're going to put the title how things have been along those words, so it could be difficulties with contact, um, the respondent's behaviour towards the applicant. You have a title here. I'm going to call it difficulties with contact, assuming that we're talking about a contact, well, a child arrangements order. And if there's been lots of messing about, I've referred to this in other episodes, say the holidays, um, re referrals to children's services, if you're working with the liar, these are all the things that have been going wrong. So in this case, you might put difficulties with contact. And here is where you're going to set out evidence evidence of abuse and evidence in support of your position and support of the orders that you need the court to make. So you may put um, 
obviously the, the evidence is going to depend on the types of difficulties you've been experiencing, the types of abuse that you've been experiencing. And again, I'm referring to the practice direction, practice direction 12J, paragraph three, which has a very wide definition of domestic abuse. So there's physical violence, the more obvious, emotional, psychological, sexual and financial abuse. These are all expected. There's other more subtle things. So you can see the that children or people are harmed by seeing the ill treatment of another. And in the context of a child, where one parent is bad-mouthing the other parent, as happens in the abusive co-parenting situation, the child is hearing, usually their mother, referred to as a liar, you can't trust her, don't do what your mum says, um, worse words. Um, and then they hear these things, and because children generally believe that they are both of their parents and they think well if daddy doesn't love mummy daddy doesn't love that half of me so that's how they they start to have their conflict within themselves when they're exposed to this kind of negativity from one parent towards the other and that is something that you do need to set out so you're looking at evidence for it so evidence here for psychological emotional abuse you might have it in text messages um, we could do a whole episode about evidence, but think about physical violence then, so you've got like if there were any witnesses of, um, around at the time, any pictures of violence, police records, text messages before, afterwards, showing something from the other party, say a threat to come round or an apology afterwards, um, emails the same, and if there's been involvement from children's services. That can also help your case in that they have to react in certain situations and if they have been involved that's further evidence in support of what happened. So you're going to be saying that on, you keep it very specific, so on this date this happened and we don't need a long background here, you say what happened because you will be able to in the hearing if necessary expand on that. Again I'm going to come back to how the statement connects with the hearing in a second. So you are talking about the thing that happened very specifically on this date, this happened, these people were here and it was in front of the children, for example. And then you say, I exhibit at, now if your name is John or Jennifer Smith, then I exhibit at JS1 text messages of the threatening behaviour before he came round, I exhibit at, at JS2 um, a witness statement etc etc like that okay same with emotional psychological and sometimes sexual these things can be demonstrated in text messages i've said before in previous episodes about the importance of gray rock and reduce not giving the abuser fuel so what you're doing is you're communicating in writing so that then you have evidence you're communicating in writing because you, you can have a record over time and that can be very telling. I mean, it may feel like nothing while you're sort of like saving all your text messages. But if you can look back over a period of time, say a year, and you can see that there's patterns in within that with the arrangements and the abusive uh, behaviour, for example. So that I can't stress the importance of keeping it in writing and keeping a record, keeping a record of text, keeping a record of emails. And this is the kind of thing that will show an abusive attitude, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, potentially. Um, as well as that, you've also got, again, witnesses, police records, if it's been reported, you may have doctor's um, notes, a letter from the doctor, which can support the fact that you've been under some kind of psychological distress, if that's what's been happening. I'm referring again to the episode on mental health and court proceedings and the importance of seeking help if you are struggling through the very emotional child arrangements and especially when there's been domestic abuse. Uh, financial abuse, usually more difficult to show. Um, and you've got to be careful here because the courts tend to separate finance and children in proceedings and in separating um, the two matters they tend to get a little bit cross if people are referring to child maintenance because the court's attitude is going to be take it to child maintenance services or similar. They would not approve of stopping contact because the maintenance wasn't being paid for example although they would tell the non-paying party that they do need to sort themselves out. So it's a difficult one financial. Okay, I'm staying on this section. So this is the evidence and you're setting out on this date, this happened. It could be a, a physical incident or it could be an, you know, 
an emotionally abusive incident, you may have text supporting some, something that's intended to cause you distress, either through the children, um, if they've been, as we've discussed in a in previous episode, lying about things to the social worker, to the school, to other people, um, and you're getting other text messages or reports from other people, the school. Think carefully about the kind of evidence you have here, and you probably have more than you think. Again, talk to a legal advisor or a solicitor or to your <clears throat> to women's aid or domestic, local domestic abuse support to help you to work out the types of abuse that are going on. And I will just plug the book as usual. If you have not read Living with the Dominator or you're not aware of the work of Pat Craven or the Freedom Programme, these are usually um, one of those moments of realisation for a lot of people. When they do the Freedom Programme, it's like they suddenly get everything into sharp focus and they can suddenly see all of the abuse that's been going on. That's because Pat Craven has devised a model of the abusive personality, which, in my opinion, is what needs to be trained throughout the judiciary, social workers, CAFCAS, teachers. Um, it just needs to be that there needs to be further training about the more subtle forms of abuse and you can have a look at that book and it's okay to say okay yes I'm having that kind of abuse or it may be some kind of sexual control um, I've referred to that in my own case before um, and, and it's sh setting that out very clearly keep it brief keep it succinct in your evidence allows the court to make findings along those lines. One of the things in evidence is to also look at the effect of any abuse on any children um, that can range from um, how they are presenting at school. You may be able to speak to the school about it. I do advise that as well, speaking to the school, speaking to the GP, speaking to other people to help support you in your position of what you think is going on. And they can perhaps provide letters, the school could provide letters about the children, a childminder, a health visitor, don't forget health visitors with young children. Quite often health visitors are asked or that they have to ask about domestic abuse, they have to have the other party out of the room while they're speaking to the mother-to-be, um, and they ask about domestic abuse. As it's a standard question, it may be helpful for you to get back in touch with your medical practice, your health visitor, and see if they've made a record of anything that you may have talked about, or even their obs observations of you if you were at that time not discussing the situation. A health visitor may say, I'm a little bit concerned, even though you haven't said necessarily there's domestic abuse. Lots of different bits of evidence, medical records obviously, if you've got medical records of injuries or the treatment of injuries, um, any psychological or emotional injuries, you might be talking to um, a GP about how you feel and be being prescribed medications for those as well. This is all good evidence that you can use. We could do a whole episode on evidence, so I'm going to allow you just to sort of like think through that, set out your main parts of evidence, the most important things, the things that you have good evidence for. So your allegations, so on this day there was this violence, here are the photos, this, this and this. If you also have some things where you, your evidence is a little bit shaky, but it's had a, a very significant effect, you may also wish to say that that's what happened as well. And the evidence here is only what you're saying. So it's your evidence in chief. And this is how it's going to tie into the hearing that you're going to. So these statements with evidence will be before a hearing. And so in child arrangements, it could be before the fact finding. It could be before a contested final hearing. Uh, in a non-molestation order, it could be again in a contested final hearing, uh, same with an occupation order. The statement will be filed with the court and then when you go to that hearing, so the contested final hearing for child arrangements, the fact finding hearing, the non-molestation order contested hearing, when you go to these, when you give evidence at that hearing, when you stand on the stand to give evidence and you swear on the Bible or you affirm to tell the truth, the first thing you will be doing is talking about your statement, whether you're representing yourself and being asked questions by the judge or whether you have a barrister and the barrister is then asking you questions, taking you through your statement. They'll start off with saying, is that your signature at the back, swearing that this is truth? And then they'll take you through it. And that's where if you don't have the evidence, your barrister or the judge will be asking you to explain a bit about it. And obviously things are better supported with evidence, but even if as I've said before, if they need to, what they will do is they'll hear two conflicting sides of what happened and they will make a decision based on perhaps the other findings that have been made and they can make findings based just on how a person presents. So that's the evidence, that's the big section. 
okay? Setting out all of these reasons why you are taking the position that you're taking and asking the court to make the order that it makes. So going back to our flow chart, we've had three rows. The first row being the order sought, and then why you're seeking that order, and then the evidence in support of your position. So you've set that out here. You may be going on to another page now, so next arrow down. And then just very briefly, I want you to state the other party's position. So let's pick an example of child arrangements, and you may be saying, I don't think there should be contact at the moment until you know, the behaviour's been addressed or until the court's made findings. Um, if it's a non mol your position may be that you want a non molestation order in place for 12 years. And you look at the other party's position, which you've got so far in their documents, and you say, well, this person, you know, wants a 50-50 shared care with the children, this person doesn't want a non molestation order, this person disputes the, find the allegations that I'm making, and just set out their position, okay? At this stage, keep it really brief. I only want this to be like one paragraph really at the most. So one or two paragraphs, just acknowledging what the position is and briefly what you think about that position. So for example, if they are saying they want a 50-50 shared care, you know that the communication is appalling because you're working with an abusive co-parent um, and that they do everything that they can to cause problems for the child arrangements, then you probably don't want a 50-50 arrangement. So you'd be saying that that's the, you need, it requires excellent communication, you don't think you've got that. So you, you're setting out why you think their position is wrong, but you keep it brief. Again, don't go into a full background about so-and-so sister said that and that meant that on this day this happened and this happened because of that. Keep it really, really succinct here, okay? This is what they're saying, this is what I think about it. So that's the fourth section. And then getting into really easy bits now, so coming down from there, the fifth section, all I want you to do is to put a title here, the application, and it's a summary, okay? So this is my application for a non-molestation order, this is father's application for a child arrangements order, this is father's application for an enforcement order, if you're being asked to write statements about that. Um, you set out here... Um, their position, your position, and what you're asking the court to find. Okay, so really, again, really, really succinct paragraphs, maybe one, two paragraphs here, just setting out about the application. The application was made on this date. Um, prior to that, there'd been no contact. Again, keeping it very, very short at this stage. And then finally, just, just for completeness, because we're going to turn all this around, last heading, the parties. So I am so-and-so, and I am the applicant in these proceedings. You should write, I am John Smith, Jenny Smith of, and then either you put your address or you say of a confidential address. And remember, if your address is confidential, you must complete form C8 and send it to the court. You set out your address there that cannot be given to the other party. So that's the confidential details. If the court needs to get in touch with you, they have their information and it's okay to say of a confidential address here. So I am the applicant or respondent in this matter, be it child arrangements, non-molestation order, etc. And then the other party is, and you say who it is, okay, and you also say if there are any children. So we are parents of two children and you name the children, okay. Now this is the bit, like, like in the position statement, we're going to actually turn it all around. In, turn it, in turning it around, okay, we, we start with the parties. Okay, so on a new clean sheet of paper, parties, I am John Smith, Jenny Smith of address or confidential address and this is my application for child arrangements and this is in response to so-and-so's application for child arrangements. Okay, parties and then paragraph two and I'll put these in numbered headings. So parties, if you've got three paragraphs, I am, the other party is, the children are, heading one, paragraph one and then one, 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 two, one, three, like that. And then paragraph two, so the application, this may be just one paragraph saying what the application's about, what you want the court to do, what the other party wants the court to do, and anything else relevant about the application. So you may say that this application is made on short notice or urgently. Um, anything else that you think is relevant, keeping it short at that stage. Now you go, you can also put in a little bit just there about sort of like your position is that there should not be child arrangements or there should be indirect contact or there should be a non-molestation order. Just quickly set that there. 
In the third paragraph, the other party's position. Okay, so if you are the applicant, you say the respondent's position, and obviously the way around, if you're the respondent, you refer to the applicant's position. Set out what the other party is saying, and briefly why you think this is wrong. And now we come into the big section. Okay, so this is paragraph four, and this section I imagine that you will fall into subheadings. So paragraph four, one on this date. The applicant was violent, so you're talking, you may be talking about difficulties with contact, the need for a non molestation order, um, evidence in support of domestic abuse for fact finding. This title depends on the kind of statement that you're writing here. And it will be quite a significant, hefty paragraph. This one will cover several pages, possibly. Again, remember your word and page count here. And that should give you an idea of what the court wants to look at. So you're setting out the things that have happened. Remember, we've talked about the evidence. This is where you will relate things through. So I exhibit at JS1 a letter from my doctor confirming that during this period of time, I was seeking support for psychological distress, emotional distress, uh, mental health issues, um, etc., etc. Okay, you're setting out your evidence very factually. On this date, this happened, and here's my evidence. I ask the court to find that on this day, this happened and it had an effect on the children, and it affected my parenting, or whatever else it is you need to say there, okay? Again, being specific, also on this date, separate incident, this happened, um, you can refer to the other party having lied in proceedings here, and, you know, all that sort of thing. So you're setting out the evidence, and at the end of each section, or each sub-paragraph here, say, I ask the court to find, and think, what do you want the court to find in this evidence, okay? These findings are important. Okay, then you're going on to the fifth section, which is your position. So if you are the applicant, you say applicant's position. If you're the respondent, obviously, say respondent's position. It's a bit obvious. So your position here, applicants or respondents. And again, remember, this is a brief paragraph. You might be saying something like, um, my position is that there is domestic abuse in the relationship and the court needs to determine if it's safe for contact to proceed. Um, and you refer to the to the evidence that you've previously set out at the, the new paragraph four, okay, in support of your position, and then closing it off, so getting smaller now, okay, so that that's your position, and now back to the order that you, you're seeking. So here, you would be saying, I ask the court to make an order in the following terms, um, that the respondent has been abusive to the applicant, um, that a for the court to order a non-molestation order or a child arrangements order or that there be indirect contact only until the perpetrator of the abuse has accessed a course um, anything anything at all like that keeping it very very specific think about what you want the order to say when you get it back from the court and visualize the order setting out the things that you need to happen okay so that this case of the court looking at it and you being very clear what you want them to do Okay, so I hope that's helpful. That's effectively we've turned everything around. So we've worked through sort of the parties, the application, the other party's position. You've got a heading here difficulties with contact, um, domestic abuse in the relationship, and this is where you're setting out all of your evidence and then close it into your position. Okay, so summarizing all of that into your position and then the order sort in the same terms that you want the court to make the order. Don't forget your exhibits, they need to be on a separate headed sheet with the party names, the case number. All statements must have the case number on them and they must finish with a sentence which is a statement of truth. One thing that the statement must do is that it must finish at the end with something called the statement of truth. Now if you remember the uh, templates for witness statements that I showed you from this master order, it says that the templates or the sentence that you have to write there is I believe that the facts stated in this witness statement are true and you must sign the statement, put, type your name underneath and also date it. Okay, That has to happen so you're making a statement of truth to the court and you're telling the court that what you're saying is true which of course it, it must be. You will need to confirm the statement of truth when you are giving evidence at the hearing so it's important to put that in as well for the court to accept it. I hope that that's been helpful um, I am hoping that this has assisted you to get your head around how to start with the witness statement. 
the first thing to do is just to start it and then it tends to be a continually changing process for a while. These statements can take a while to set out so give yourself a good week or two. Um, however, as I've always said in all of these evidence, it, it, in all of these episodes, please gather evidence as much as you can even before you get to court. Okay, so I hope that's been helpful. Thank you for watching this episode of The Survivor Diaries and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode or vlog. Thank you and bye.